great to be back amongst good friends, some, some older, some newer. And, and I'd like to also congratulate all the fellows on their wonderful posters out there. I had a quick look before I came in. Um, not as much time as I would like. I looked forward to seeing some more in a minute. So well done, everybody. You can be justly proud of it. So as, as you heard, I'm from the Science and Technology Facilities Council, um, and we fund research in this area. We also fund research in particle physics, astrophysics, uh, and nuclear physics, and, and we provide the studentships in these areas throughout our program. Um, but, that's, uh, but what I'd like to do today is look at uh, some of the uh, aspects of... of uh, how does this work? Oh, I have to use this thing. So that worked. Give it a second. It'll think about it. Well, oh dear, oh dear. This always happens, doesn't it? There we go. So what I'm going to do is um, give an overview of of, um, of accelerator physics, but not not necessarily the traditional overview. I'm going to focus on discoveries of based on accelerators. So we'll do some of the fundamental questions of that face us in the universe. But I want to also stress that accelerators are very important for discovery across science in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, they really are engines of discovery in the areas of biology, chemistry, as well as materials physics, and also, indeed, particle physics and astronomy. So here you can see, just to start off, some of the, an overview at the top left, that's one of the first accelerators. I think it's a Cockroft Walton. You can see the, the guy protecting himself in, the, uh, uh, in his Faraday cage at the front, sort of stop being zapped. This was in the years before um, health and safety took hold. Uh, and then you go quick around to see, from the very early beginnings, you go down and you see what the modern accelerator would look like. This is actually the diamond accelerator, which I'm going to talk about a bit later in more detail, where it's a multi-component set of machines that all build up to, to form a, a one big machine. And in the center, you can see um, uh, Lawrence in, in Berkeley with one of the larger uh, early cyclotrons, one of the early uh, experiments that, that developed the, the project. And then at the bottom right, you can see the outcome of some of these new accelerators from an exquisite X-ray diffraction pattern, which allows us to understand molecules and structures of matter in exquisite detail. And the one above, the, uh, it shows you, a few years ago, you will remember, I'm sure, the, when the deadly virus that has shut down the countryside uh, came, the, the head, foot and mouth disease. And I'll come to explain how particle accelerators were instrumental in finding a way to, to create a new vaccine. Let's look at some fundamental questions. Things that particle physicists, such as myself, would like to, to answer. What's the role of gravity? What's the origin of matter, origin of mass? We think we've got some idea about that now. I'm sure you've all heard about the, the Higgs boson. That's not the only mass that exists. We'd like to find out what other masses are out there. Uh, and a fundamental constant, which you would, in school have all learned about, Newton's constant. If we turn it around, do a little bit of a net, of dimensional analysis, we can tell from that that there's going to be something interesting happening at much, much higher energy scales. I've written down there as 1.2 times 10 to the 19 GeV. And 1 GeV is the amount of energy required to create one proton. So this is a huge amount of energy. It's something that we have not um, addressed directly. But we, nonetheless, if we're going to understand gravity and, and other aspects of fundamental physics, we're going to have to look, somehow look at these sort of energy scales. And to do that, we're going to have to use all the tools at our disposal. Looking at the history of the universe, at the right is where we are now. If we turn the clock backwards, turning the clock back in, in cosmological terms is the same as increasing the temperature of the universe, increasing the typical energies involved in, in particle interactions. So we are now where we are at the right-hand side. If we turn the clock backwards down to before it becomes rapidly smaller in, on this graph, uh, we sort of know everything up into that, into that band there at the, at the end there, sort of a few sort of 100 GeV or so of, of energy. If we go above that, we don't really know what's there yet, and that's what the LHC is trying to do at the moment, see what's there. We'd really like to be able to extrapolate from what we know back towards the Big Bang. Some people would like to go in before that, but that's, that's not where I'm going to go today. But can we access such energies? Well, the energies are out there. These, these particles are very energetic that come from outer space. Uh, the cosmic rays are hitting the atmosphere all the time at very, very high energies. And there you can see a graph of number of, of energy, particles of the particular energy um, against the energy that they have. And you can see it sort of tails off very rapidly at 10 to the 20 electron volts, very large number, but there aren't very many of them. And this is why one of the reasons why we are, we are quite confident in starting the LHC up when people are worried about these big collisions that may cause, cause us to collapse inside a black hole. We can say, no, no, it's been happening all the time since the beginning, almost the beginning of time. These collisions are happening all the time up there in our own atmosphere. But if we look at even at these really, really high energies, 
what's the, the useful energy for creating new particles or looking at uh, new interactions? It comes out to something like 10 to the 5 GeV, so something like 100 TeV. That's about 10 times or more, um, almost 100 times what we're looking at at the LHC at the moment. So it's still very interesting. We'd like to know what's happening there, but um, we, we, the problem is, to, to actually really understand in, in detail what these interactions are, we'd have to put a particle detector up into the atmosphere, which isn't very practical, and they don't happen very often. We do look at them by looking at, um, looking at what, how they produce particles that shower down to Earth, uh, but again, the detailed interactions are going to be very hard to, to reconstruct. So what we'd really like to do instead is measure what we do know very well. So all the particle interactions at the LHC and, and other accelerators in the past, uh, we measure things as precisely as we possibly can. And so what I'm trying to show you here, don't worry about what it means in detail, what I'm trying to say is that in the bottom, on the left-hand side of these plots is the low energies where we're measuring now. And if you, using the theoretical knowledge that, that you've built up from looking at all these interactions and how they, they play with each other, you can then extrapolate to what the theory would look like at very high energies. And on the left-hand side, which is the standard model that we, we know, we think we know pretty well now we found the Higgs, uh, it doesn't quite match up at high energies. It does still complicated. But some other models get much, much simpler at high energies. Which model is right? Well, we need to use experiment, experiments to find out. We can't do it directly yet, probably never, but because we don't have energies, um, we can't we've got accelerators which are powerful enough. Nonetheless, we can measure exquisitely accurately at the low energy scale, and therefore thereby extrapolate uh, precisely to, to higher energies. And that's what we're doing at these big machines now. The LHC is, is on the way there for, um, for discovery at sort of the percent level of precision, maybe a bit higher in some, the Higgs is already less than a percent at the moment. But then we're going to we'll look at the next generation of uh, accelerators, linear collider or muon colliders or some other um, aspects. We'll hear this afternoon some other ideas that are coming out for getting high energies. So we really measure these lighter states to very high precision and thereby get a better picture of what's happening at high energies which we can't reach directly. Okay, so this is the only equation in my talk, so don't panic. Uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm showing you at the top here is, well, there's a typical cross-section. That's a particle physics speak for probability of something to happen. If nothing happens with certainty. You'd have to do lots of events, lots of collisions, to see something that, that, that get a, an overall picture of what the, what the theory is. So he, we know E is energy. If we go, as you go up at energy, the rate at which reactions naturally occur, or the probability with which they occur, goes down. That's pure dimensional argument. You can't get away from that. So we know from purely fundamental reasoning, very simple reasoning, that, that the reaction rates will go down unless we increase the intensity of the beams that we use to produce them. So we know that if we want to get to high energies, we have to increase the intensity, what we call the luminosity of the beams as well. It's not just good enough to get high energies. You need lots of particles to do it. So to explore high energies, you need high luminosity. That's, uh, that's, as I say, that's uh, accelerator speak for intense beams. And it's not just about energy, it's also about quality. To get the intense beams, they have to be what's called cold. The particles can't be jiggling around too much inside the beams, or they don't collide, you can't squeeze them tightly enough to collide with high intensity. That is not easy. That requires a lot of beam diagnostics, which many of you in the, in the fellows have worked on and to deal with. Here I see a typical beam line. This is, in fact, the diamond beam line being constructed. And you can see it's not just um, cavities producing energy. It's lots of other stuff. It's magnets focusing things. It's, it's beam diagnostics getting in there. What do these beams look like? How do we squeeze them down? How do we make them high quality? That is one of the biggest aspects of, of accelerator physics that you have to get right in order to get the beams you need to do the science. So let's look at the LHC. You've all heard about it. Um, it's a 27-kilometer tunnel under the Alps near, near Geneva. Um, and it's designed to supply 7 TeV protons head-on collisions. And now it's running at 6.5 TeV per beam. Um, so we're almost there. And some of the experts are sitting in the audience. So if you've got any questions, I'll point you directly to them in a minute. Um, so here we have the collision points where you do the physics. You, you collide head-on these particles. And if you've got enough energy, you'll produce the Higgs boson. And we've shown that that works. The energy um, of each proton, this is now all in electron volts. Electron volts, as you all know, is the energy required by an electron when it passes through one volt. So it's a typical energy from the battery. So that's uh, to car batteries, about 12 of them, 12 electron volts. And then you go up to 700,000 electron volts for the very first accelerators, like the one I showed you on my introductory slide. Uh, so and then the, the, oh, look, count the zeros yourself, 7 TeV uh, for the LHC. It's a lot of energy. So the stored energy is, is, is huge. It's actually, in the magnets, 
to, to keep those particles of 7 TeV in a circle, you need very strong magnets. And to get a magnet, magnetic field itself stores energy. So you've actually got 10 gigajoules stored in, in, in the magnets themselves. And that's the energy, kinetic energy of, a, of, of your, your average fast-going um, aircraft carrier in the magnets itself, just, just sitting there in the energy in the magnets. In the beams themselves that the magnets are using to, 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 to steer the particles around the beam, um, that's just how, how, how we have to be able to stop these beams very, very quickly if you want to, if you want to dump them. But the energy stored in each beam is, is equivalent to, in power terms to four terawatts of power. That's the same thing as a TGV train. All that energy and power is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is stored in a, uh, in a tiny, in a tiny uh, amount of very long, thin hull. And if, and if, you, uh, if you were to dump the hull, the amount of energy could heat half a ton of copper um, uh, for 30, 360 megajoules could completely melt half a ton of copper. So you've got to be, if something, when you dump these beams, they do dump them, uh, you, you have to, it's not it's just a case of, of throwing it into a lump of copper, you've got to do something much more clever than that. So now I want to move away from, from the, the Big Bang type uh, physics and move instead to what we're doing in this country. We've got big accelerators in this country as well, producing lots of science, and I want to just concentrate on that now for the rest of the talk and, and, and the science that comes out of it. One of our big facilities, uh, SDFC runs, is not far from here in Darsbury, um, Darsbury Laboratory, and there, as, as Carlson mentioned earlier, you've got the Cockroft Institute at the top right-hand side, and there, the tower is an old, uh, an old accelerator, not there anymore, but initially it was there for doing nuclear physics, um, electrostatic um, van de Graaff generator. Uh, on the, on the left-hand side now, there used to be what the, the SRS, synchrotron radiation source, which now no longer is there, but now I'll come back to that later because it's part of my story. Um, but now this is an electron beam test facility, generating, generating the next generation of, um, of very high-quality beams for, for, for future science. And that is now being done just down the road from here. And one of, you, many of you work there, and it's one of our major centers of an interest for the SCFC funds. Our other big laboratory is down in the south, southeast, near Oxford, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, and there we have two accelerators, which I'll describe in a minute. On the left-hand side there, you see ISIS, which is, is, has a different meaning these days, of course. It's a bit, uh, it's not, it's not, <laughs> this is an accelerator, don't worry. It was, uh, it's all, everything's fine. And, uh, and it, it, it's uh, what's called a spallation neutron source, and I'll describe what that means in a minute. It produces neutrons via our accelerator slamming into a lump of metal, and then because the, the, the nuclei and the, the, pro, the proton hits, uh, hits the other nuclei and then bubbles out neutrons, which are then very useful. The neutrons are what's, what's used. On the right-hand side is the diamond synchrotron, uh, which is, uh, I'll come on to describe now, but there's these two big accelerators just down, well, for me it's down the road. I came up here today. Um, but it's uh, another very important facilities that we run. We also support facilities, not just in this country, but uh, in addition to CERN, and, and, and where we have a, obviously a very major stake. We also support via, via various grants the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility and the Institute La Longuevin, the neutron facility here. The radiation is another one of these rings. The synchrotron radiation is this ring. I'll, I'll explain in a minute why we need a ring. And the, and the ILL, the, the, uh, the neutron source there, you can see it's that sort of big tin, the gray tin thing. That's actually a reactor, a nuclear reactor. That's how um, the first neutrons were produced. But it is a nuclear reactor. It's very good, it's very efficient, but people don't like living next to nuclear reactors these days. Uh, and, they, and various, they, while it's a huge amount of money now has to go into making them extra safe at post Fukushima, and they are very safe. Um, but nonetheless, the, the trend now is more towards building um, accelerator-based neutron sources because um, people feel safer with them around and they're cheaper to run. Well, you can argue be cheaper to run. But what is synchrotron radiation? Well, when, when you look up in the sky at night, you see synchrotron radiation sometimes, some stars. What it is, is uh, it, whenever you accelerate an electron, you radiate. And, or actually, any charged particle you accelerate, you radiate it to some extent. When you accelerate an electron up and down in a wire, that, that creates radio waves. That's, that's ra radiation coming from accelerating electrons. Here, um, the very first synchrotron radiation was observed back in 1054, the supernova of 1054. And indeed, it's been logged in the yellow. I, don't, I can't read that myself. Maybe some of you can. But what, what it's doing, it's logging... The, the light seen from this, this, uh, this supernova. Um, and that, that is actually synchrotron, a good proportion of that is synchrotron light from electrons being accelerated in magnetic fields in, surrounding the um, evolving supernova. 
The, the first synchrotron radiation in particle physics was always annoying because it's how particles lose energy as they go around a ring. And we want to, don't want them to lose energy. We want them to keep their energy so that we can use it for useful stuff, like creating Higgs bosons. But now it's realized that, well, we soon realized that uh, this radiation is also useful for other aspects of science, not just, um, uh, well, it's not just a nuisance, it's not just a loss of energy. But if you use it carefully, you can get new sources of X-rays. And that's now being used for uh, material science, chemical and biological studies. And the first machine of this kind dedicated to producing synchrotron radiation for, for, um, part, for biology and, and other sciences was the, the SRS at Darsbury, which I mentioned before. Now, synchrotron radiation, this is this diagram so you can picture it. If you bend a particle here in a bending magnet, it, it, it's pretty much tangential to the trajectory of the particle. You get X-ray emission. And from those X-rays, you can then put collimators and you can then choose the energies you want it's a broad range of energies in the beam that comes from that, but you can pick out which ones you want and use it as a very intense source of X-rays. More modern, well, other, other, you get a lot of X-rays this way. If we want, if we want more precise X-rays or, or indeed um, coherent type things, you can then you can use these things called wigglers or uh, undulators. They wiggle the beam, and, and because it's bending it many, many, many times, you get even more intensity coming out, and that is also used for, for looking at, um, at down at crystals or, or biological samples downstream. So those things are in there. And the SRS was the first case. Um, and as part of our arguments for creating new facilities, um, we, we did a study, well, not me, but the, the, the council did a study of, um, of the synchrotron radiation source. Uh, so there were, there were, these are the benefits that, were, that accrued from it. So we've got direct short-term ones, indirect, indirect and medium-term, and global, usually long-term ones. Let me just talk you through them quickly. It helped train about 4,000 PhD students. Every one of them is a productive scientist out in the economy. 11,000 users trained in techniques. Many of you are exactly in that situation now. You're now trained technicians or engineers who can go off and do something useful. 100 staff are now working on other synchrotrons, and 1,200 protein structures uh, solved. Now, a protein structure is a very complicated thing. Um, it's many, 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 many atoms involved in it, and they're all scattering light in different ways. So you need to, but using this exquisite form of X-rays, you can actually now work out what those structures are. I, think, I forget what this one was. I think it's one of the nasty viruses that, that make us all ill. In direct or medium term, nine spin-outs, 25 patents, patents, 11 licenses, 200 industrial proprietary users, new applications, things you wouldn't even think about, like RF coating and television transmitters. All that comes from the knowledge that you get from working these sort of machines. Then long term, globally long term, this first, it, was, it, it, it generated, this was the first second generation multi-user synchrotron. And then things like the diamond that I'm going to talk about a bit more in a minute came from the knowledge from, from here. It pioneered protein crystallography. So these very detailed protein structures that we're talking about, were gen the methods to do that were generated just down the road here in Darsbury. And it led the way to 70 further facilities. Now everyone's got these things. Every country has them pretty much. Um, and uh, and it, for good reason, because it gave networks of all the, all the reasons above and, and for the intrinsic interest of the science, of course. So diamond light source. This is the one that's, that we're currently using, uh, the UK National Facility in, in for synchrotrons. Um, don't worry about all those numbers there. The experts can enjoy reading that. The big thing is it's like a big donut, and you, and you can see the cars around the outside. So you get the scale, this typical house in the bottom right-hand side. And that's sitting in Oxfordshire, uh, and, uh, and it's used daily for, for, for all sorts of science, from biology to materials. I thought I'd just show you this. On the left-hand side is the, it's the birth of, of X-rays, someone's hand. I think it might be Mrs. Röntgen, His hand is there. Um, and then... That, that, that's a, you can see the sort of resolution that you got from, from the early, early, early technology. Then you evolve the ideas. Now with the, the modern synchrotron sources, see if it'll just work for me. Um, here we have uh, what you can generate. This is a, a map using the top to bottom is 800 microns, so one millimeter is 1,000 microns. It's less than a millimeter. You get this exquisite detail of this. I think this is some kind of seed. But not only outside, but you can also then start to look inside this thing from the X-ray and from, from reconstructing using the tomography of what's going on inside this, this, this biological sample. So in macromolecular macro samples, you can understand structures and therefore functions. Uh, but you can also, um, what, what is diamond actually used for? Well, uh, let's let me talk around some of these because I, I, th I think it's, it's very instructive. So top left, what, how on earth does it tell us about planets? Well, it tells us about planets because it allows us to explore extreme conditions of matter. You can get very high densities and pressures using anvils and diamonds things, squeezing things very, very tightly. And at the same time, you fire it with x-rays and see what's happening to the structure 
of, of molecules when you're under these extreme conditions. Uh, for making new materials, for instance, for fast cars uh, and, and new, new, new structures there, here I'll come on to a structure here how you can measure strain in, in jet engines using, using synchrotron light. You, what does the bone look like? My, microstructures in bone, the similar thing I just showed you for that seed or whatever it was, you can do with also samples of bone and understand osteoporosis and how that, how that, how that develops. New sources, understanding photosynthesis, but also new materials and techniques for photovoltaic cells. Obviously looking at uh, new batteries. You all got iPods and similar things in your pockets. And what the, the annoying thing about that, of course, is they run out of power. So what people are doing now is looking at fundamentally the magnetic structures and, 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 and components of batteries and other materials to make these things longer lasting and better, better, better for us. Um, I'll come up at the end to, to up here. I'll do some more. These are, these are crystals. These are not crystals. These are um, by very, very complex molecules whose structure is actually determined or worked out, not, not by guessing, but by looking, reconstructing, or well, partly guessing, but mostly by reconstructing uh, what, what the, how the X-rays scatter and thereby how did they, what, what scattered them. I'll come on again to the, the, the poor old cows in a minute. Here we are, the poor old cows. This is the important research from, from back in 19, March 2013, just, just after or about the time of the foot and mouth outbreak. Uh, and so what really was needed, or would be needed, was, is, is a vaccine to, 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 to vaccinate these cows. Now, they didn't really want to do that using real vaccine, real virus, or dead virus, because it's then harder to determine whether you vaccinated the cow or if it's got the disease. If you, wanted to, if you take your average cow and it's, it's not looking too well, what, what's wrong with it? So what, what, what they wanted to do was, was take the, the virus out of the shell. Because when your body reacts to uh, uh, an infection, it's a viral infection, it really act, looks at the outer surface, because that's what it sees, really. And so your, all your, your, your defenses attack the shell. So if you take the bit out in the middle, it's then a harmless thing. And the shell then uh, will alert your body to uh, or prepare it for the infection. The problem with this is if you haven't got anything inside it, it's not very stable. So it tends to, go, it tends to fall flat and, and, and tends to break down. So what the, what the guys at Diamond did was to look, guys and girls at Diamond did was to look inside this and really work out what the structure was and why, what was the weak bit and how could you strengthen it. And they did this. They managed, from understanding the structure using x-rays, they then could make a, a safe vaccine which didn't degrade under, under huge conditions and which when you injected into a cow, you could tell it had been injected with the vaccine and it was not infected with the virus itself. So that's the sort of thing that this new technology is enabling us to do. I mentioned before, strain, the strain, when you fly in an aeroplane, you expect, it, you expect things to stay together. And these things are under huge stress. And by looking at you, um, the, the, the molecules and the atoms and, and, and how they, and the separations, and you can then determine the strain using x-rays of what, what's, what's going on in these things. And that's obviously of, of huge benefit. And it goes on and on and on. You could, write, you could have a whole, a whole day on the sort of science coming from these, these new forms of, um, of, of light. There's a new accelerator, which I don't have time to talk about now, and, and, and Ralph, maybe Ralph will tell us a little bit more about it. There's an XFEL, a few electron laser being developed in Hamburg, Germany, which, which actually looks not only with X-rays, but with coherent X-rays, so like lasers for X-rays. So you can you think of what you can do with holograms, you're going to start doing this sort of thing with X-rays rather than visible light. The, the, the opportunities out there are, are immense, driven by accelerator science. Another accelerator, uh, this is the ISIS one I mentioned before, you'll remember that name, and here, again, it's a multi-component accelerator. It has a LINAC, accelerating protons. And then you, you accelerate it even further in a ring, a synchrotron ring, to 800 MeV. And then you fire it out to one of two um, uh, target stations. Now, these target stations are essentially lumps of metal. Oh, they're, they're very complicated lumps of metal. But, but the idea is then it is the proton goes in, smashes nuclei inside the target. Those nuclei then produce neutrons, and those neutrons bubble away. And you capture them downstream. In, in various uh, targets uh, and, and understand whatever thing you put in its path. So you put a crystal in there or a piece of metal or something. And then you can, and because neutrons are neutral uh, and they're very penetrating, they don't get deflected, they go deep inside the material and they act as waves as well, just as photons act as waves, they're particles, particle wave duality, I'm sure you've all heard of that. So you can use neutrons like waves and you can actually then diffract and see what's going on inside, inside particles using neutrons. And it's complementary to what goes on inside synchrotrons. Some things overlap, but if you want to know particularly what hydrogen is up to, what hydrogen atoms are doing, then uh, these, these things, neutron scattering, is particularly good. So you can get a complicated molecule. The X-ray can tell you most of it, but then what, where are the hydrogens really doing? What are they doing? The neutrons can tell you that. Put the two together, you get these beautiful structures that I mentioned. 
So there, close up, is, uh, is, is one of the target stations. And, and what, let me just give you one case study of why, why this is useful for the economy. So in, in one case study was, uh, the, we have some nuclear power stations, in, from EDF own them in the UK. And, and they're very, it's very, very important, obviously, that the container vessels for these things are, are, um, are sound. You don't, want, you don't want the radioactive material leaking out. You want it to do what it does without, without getting radioactivity everywhere. And everything has a life. And how long is a, how long is the life of a of, of a welded um, a welded structure under intense neutron bombardment? You, you can make models. You can never be absolutely sure. So they were going to dismantle it and, and decommission it. But we could show by by looking at neutron scattering, going deep inside and seeing what's there, seeing how this material responds to neutron waves, that uh, that there's at least more five years, you have at least five more years of life. And that's the ferment of a three billion pound decommissioning cost. So to put that into real cost, the value is, is enormous. And this is, this is one example. So the value to the economy of being able to look inside materials, understand what's really going on, is huge. Another area, uh, our scientists at the ISIS um, were developing new materials to provide cheaper, cheaper and more efficient methods of hydrogen storage. Remember the hydrogen thing I mentioned earlier? It's very good for seeing what hydrogen is and what it's doing. And if you want good, efficient, um, clean hydrogen storage, need materials that can store hydrogen efficiently. So you need structures at the molecular level which will absorb hydrogen and release it when you need it. So it won't explode if you <laughs> come in with it with a match. You, want, you don't want big vats of hydrogen gas. Really, some people do do that, of course, but um, look what happened to the Zeppelin. Was it the Zeppelin? One of them. Lindenburg. Well, I forget the name of it. One which went up in... Um, you don't really want that driving around the M1. But these, these new things will store, hopefully store hydrogen safely and then efficiently. So we're looking at the atomic and molecular structure of new materials to see how they absorb and release hydrogen gas, new materials, and avoid safety fears with compressed gas. One thing I'm just going to mention, it's also at, at ISIS. I, I didn't mention it. Let me just go back if I can find the, the outline. There we go. This little thing here. Um, it's called mice. Now here we're, taking, we're putting protons into a, into a target, uh, a, little, a small little wire target, which you flip in and out of the beam. And that produces pions, which produces muons. Now, why muons? Why are they interesting? Well, muons are much heavier than electrons. So you can accelerate them in a circle, and they will produce synchrotron radiation, but much, much less than electrons. So we can put them in smaller rings and get them to higher energies. They decay quickly, so you've got to do it very, very fast before they all disappear. But nonetheless, it's an idea, one of the ideas which may get us up to those high energies that we talked about at the beginning. And this, this structure here, I've just got a diagram of it, but now it's, it's not fully like this, but it's getting towards like this, is now being run up. I think it's starting this week, in fact. It's very topical. The opening, I think, was yesterday, uh, data taking at this facility, down at, down at Rutherford Lab, where pions, new ones are coming out of here, and then the idea is to cool them down. Remember cooling, I mentioned it at the beginning. You want to get these beams cool so you can get the quality beams that you can compress well and get data out of. And the, the idea is there to, to understand how you do this. You slow them down, you speed them up then in one direction only, and so you need radio frequency cavities to do that. You need hydrogen uh, devices to, to, to slow the beams down. Highly complex technology. The idea itself is, is actually quite simple. But getting it, getting it to work is extremely difficult. And I'm not sure it will work. So this is, this is pure um, technological, technological science in a way. It's like the frontier of technology that we want to show will work or not. Let me just finish. I'm getting short of time. But I've, I've, I think I've got my main points across. Um, and some of the applications that are coming out of this, I mean, we can talk about the World Wide Web. Was that particle physics or was that an accelerator physics thing? Well, the two go together. I would say that one motivates the other. Huge data rates are needed not only for data collection, but also for the things that control the accelerators and make sure that they work and continue to work. We're going to hear more about medical applications later, I think. Not everybody knows that the first capacitive touch screens, those things that are in your pocket all the time and you're using now to probably even now to tweet to Twitter or something, they were first developed at CERN in 1973 because some person said, wouldn't it be easier if we didn't have to go, if we could stare at our screen and, and get this thing to work that way um, and all the materials and things that go into high-speed trains and the rest of it. But hey, you could hear a bit later, I think, about medical devices, but CERN and others are involved and, and there's, there's a big uh, uh, centre here around Manchester looking at this as well in Liverpool uh, at, at medical physics. Uh, and so this is where CERN is getting together. You need, for, for iron therapy, we'll hear about later, you need beams, you need detecting the part, detectors to see whether those beams do what they, where they get deflected and what they look like, and you need large-scale computing to understand what's coming out. So I think um, they have wide application, and I think I've made that point, but another point I just want to get across before I finish up is, um, is, is, the, is the broader uh, theme of, of just sheer wonder and interest of science. 
Uh, the Higgs discovery we all know about, it reached 12 million people, um, 12,000 stories, you read, read the numbers. Uh, it was a huge t societal leap, I think, not just a, 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 for science, but also for society, in being part of the adventure. And that was driven by the accelerators that allowed us to do this. And this, I, I believe, is a, it's a Higgs boson at the um, Olympics. I will just mention here that, um, that well, one thing that SCFC does, and, and with all our, all our fantastic graduate students who always help us out in this, it's going around the country. In fact, maybe some of you were, were at such an exhibition uh, where we explain the, the, the science, the accelerators. This is the, LH, uh, the cardboard cutout of the LHC tunnel, which is remarkably effective because it's the same scale and you get graduate students in there to, uh, to feel about it, talk about it, and, and enthuse about their science. So that's something that we've done. Let me summarize them. I started off with a very uh, open question about the fundamental questions of gravity matter and how accelerators can lead us at least some of the way through exquisite measurements that we can then extrapolate and understand what's up there or not. Uh, it, it also, the question mark, can produce and understand new materials and new molecules in exquisite detail. And this is something that is exploding. If you're interested in science more broadly, this is a, a fantastic field, I think, and it's driven by capability, which is given by um, accelerator science. It's not only energy. We all, energy gets the, the headlines, you know, 70 EV and all of that. But in fact, to get there, you need high luminosity, stability, and quality of beams. Very exquisite technology. And many of the people you have been working on that in your projects. Uh, accelerators and accelerator-based science are also not, not only drivers of, of science, but they're also engines of inspiration. And I've you know, tried to get that across with the young people coming in, and you're here for the similar reason, to understand about it and push all areas of science backwards, um, forwards, push back the frontiers is what I meant uh, in there. So I think I've got in the line that accelerators are engines of discovery across all fields of science. And there I will stop. Thank you. <laughs>